Good afternoon and welcome to New America. Thank you all for coming to our session, America's First Foreign Fighter for Al-Qaeda After 9-11, Bryant Neal Venus Tells His Story. My name is Melissa salik Verk, and I'm a policy analyst with New America's International Security Program. For those of you new to New America, we are a think and action tank, a civic platform that connects a research institute, technology lab, solutions network, media hub, and public forum. The International Security Program aims to provide evidence-based analysis of some of the toughest security challenges facing American policymakers and the public. Our research has addressed homegrown American terrorism, the United States drone wars abroad, and the proliferation of drones around the world, and the profound changes in warfare wrought by new technology and societal changes. I'd like to introduce you to our two panelists today, Bryant Neal Venus and Mitchell D. Silber. Bryant Neal Venus is an American citizen who traveled to Pakistan in 2007 to fight United States and coalition forces present in Afghanistan. He ultimately joined Al-Qaeda, received basic training from the group, participated in Al-Qaeda military operations in Afghanistan, and discussed a plot to attack the Long Island Railroad before being captured in late 2008 in Pakistan. He subsequently cooperated with the U.S. government and its allies, and is considered to have been one of the most prized sources of actionable intelligence against Al-Qaeda. He recently completed his prison sentence for his actions and has been working with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and with Mitch. Mitchell D. Silver is the former Director of Intelligence Analysis at the New York City Police Department and is currently an adjunct professor at Columbia University's Graduate School for Public and International Affairs. At the NYPD, he supervised the research, collection, and analysis for the Intelligence Division's entire portfolio of ongoing terrorism-related investigations and was responsible for strategic assessments of emerging and future threats to the city of New York. Mitch co-authored the 2007 NYPD report, Radicalization in the West, The Homegrown Threat, and is the author of The Al-Qaeda Factor, Plots Against the West, published in 2012 by the University of Pennsylvania Press. He is also the chief executive of Parallel Networks, a new nonprofit committed to working with former terrorists to combat violent extremism. Brian and Mitch co-wrote a featured article for the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point published this month, titled Al-Qaeda's First American Foreign Fighter After 9-11. This afternoon, we will begin with an NYPD introduction by Mitch and how and why Bryant's story became so important. And then Bryant will share a brief account of his background and history. We'll follow with an engaging discussion and we'll save the last 30 minutes or so for audience questions. And with that said, we'll begin with Mitch. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, New America, for hosting Brian and I here today. Um, really appreciate the fact that this organization focuses a lot about CT issues in the homeland and overseas, and, and always a pleasure to be at New America. Um, I thought, since most of you are here to really hear Brian's story, I'm just going to provide a little context to uh, what, why Brian is so important, why he was of such concern to the NYPD, to the greater U.S. intelligence community, um, and sort of try and bring you back to 2008. Um, unlike some people in Washington, I don't have my calendar from that year, um, so I won't bring that. But I did bring slides, and some of these slides are actually from NYPD presentation given in that time period, looking at the threat uh, and looking at, frankly, Bryant and, and what that meant to New York City. Um, it was something that looked at Al-Qaeda, um, plots against mass transit systems in major cities, New York and London, and also the role that Westerners played in those plots. So just a quick moment, Brian and I connected just about the time this article came out. Uh, this was last spring, and we've been working together, and as Melissa said, um, you know, since last spring, and recently we co-authored this piece in West Point Sentinel talking about his experiences uh, overseas. But really the way Brian came onto my radar screen uh, is in late 2007, early 2008, 
when the first indications became available that there was an American overseas in Pakistan, Afghanistan, involved with Al Qaeda. And the question was, who was that individual? And within a relatively short period of time, um, the determination was made by the federal intelligence community that it was a New Yorker, and in fact, it was Bryant. Um, New York City NYPD didn't have an investigation on Bryant before he went overseas. In fact, he was not known to us. Um, however, in New York City, we were looking at a group called the Islamic Thinker Society. And this is a group that is a, an American analog of an organization overseas in the UK called al Muhajirun, uh, an Islamist group that um, does a lot of provocative street dawah, um, is very ideologically oriented in an Islamist way toward Al Qaeda, and frankly, you know, in speaking to colleagues in the UK, was a bit of a, a petri dish for many individuals in the UK who went on to turn towards violence. And in New York City, we called them a bit of a bug light uh, for aspiring jihadists. And in New York City, we were investigating this group, um, and in particular, this individual on the bottom left, Ahmed Zarini, who turns out was a friend of Bryant's um, from Long Island. Uh, in, these, in looking at plots and threats, New York City uh, was beginning to be concerned about the outer boroughs, about Nassau, Suffolk, New Jersey, in the wake of activities that had occurred in the UK. But really, that's the way Brian came on our radar screen. There's an American overseas. He's from New York. He's from Long Island. Oh, by the way, he's connected to this individual uh, in the Islamic Thinker Society. And the question is, is there some possibility that if he's with Al Qaeda, he's able to communicate back in some way that we won't know to Zarini, to the group, and can that be some type of trigger for some type of an attack? So New York City was on very high alert. Um, with that in mind. And, you know, the background of that goes back to London and the fact that there were situations where individuals from the West, London specifically, UK specifically, went overseas, linked up with Al Qaeda, and we were turned around and sent back. The July 7th bombing in London, where 52 people died, the July 21st plot, where the explosives failed, but nevertheless, you would have had five suicide bombers in the London met metro and on buses. Um, and a year later, we frankly had our own New York City version of that with the Zazi case in the fall of 2009, where, again, New Yorkers went overseas, trained with Al-Qaeda, and then were turned around to come back and do something in New York. Why did these individuals go overseas? Uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, military training, recruitment, uh, inspiration, sanction. But, you know, the reason that Bryant went, and he'll tell you more in detail, was similar to many others. They went to fight overseas. They didn't go overseas with the intention to do something back in the country from which they originated. That was their original intention, is to fight overseas um, against US and coalition forces. And frankly, you know, in their own words, Zazi, the plan was to fight against the Taliban, against the US. Mohammed Siddiqui Khan, who was the leader of the 7-7 attacks in London 2005. Um, you know, I have to do this thing. I'm doing what I'm doing for the sake of Islam, meaning going overseas and volunteering, being a foreign fighter, as we now call it. We didn't call it that terminology then. And, you know, in Brian's intent was similar. And, you know, again, this concern was that even though they went overseas to fight there, for because they were a Westerner, because they had the ability to come back into London, back to the U.S., these individuals were turned around overseas. And that was really, you know, what we were concerned about with Bryant. Uh, and although that wasn't the case, because as Melissa mentioned, he was ultimately arrested um, overseas in the Zazi plot, um, they did come back to the U.S. They did plan something against New York City, and fortunately it was thwarted in the fall of 2009. And frankly, from the NYPD and law enforcement's perspective, you don't have a lot of time to figure out who's back before they operationalize. Uh, for the 7-7 plot, you had from February to July, right? So five months. Uh, for, the t for the 721 plot, you had less time, four months. Zazi, a little bit more time, nine months. But you don't have unlimited time before individuals who have trained overseas come back, turn to, turn to action. And our conclusions at the time 
or that number one radicalization is happening in the US as well as overseas. These different fears of war, these different uh, fields of jihad are attracting people to go overseas, to go fight. Uh, New York City, because of a variety of different elements, is a likely target. And again, the similar point that you don't have unlimited time to be able to identify these people when they come back um, to stop the threat. So that's, that's sort of the context in which you know, I first came to know about Bryant. But let me stop there and hand it over to Brian. I'll tell you a little bit about his origin story. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to see me. Uh, I'm here to clarify some inaccuracies about my story and hopefully give you a better understanding on jihadism. Um, I'm going to tell you a quick um, rundown on my life. I grew up in Long Island. I was born in Queens. Um, my father moved the family out to Long Island when I was about a year old, and I grew up there. I grew up in Medford. Um, I grew up uh, going to Longwood High School, uh, the Longwood School District, sorry. And, um, you know, life on Long Island can be tough. Uh, if you don't have a car, you're kind of stuck uh, in your neighborhood. And, um, you know, so I'm going to take it from here. Uh, my family is uh, Hispanic. My mother's from Argentina, my father's from Peru. Uh, I grew up uh, middle class, lower middle class family. Uh, didn't have uh, too much sports or hobbies growing up. Uh, my neighborhood was also a mixture of um, different um, ethnic backgrounds, some black, some white, some Hispanic, it was a mix of everybody. Uh, after high school, I joined the army. Uh, it was in that period of life where you know, after high school, you're trying to figure out what to do with your life and which direction to go in. I talked to an Army recruiter, and he may have seemed like the Army was the greatest thing in the world. And, and uh, you know, I, I fell in love with his, his pitch, and I signed up, and I realized that wasn't for me. So uh, I, I got discharged in the Army for a general discharge. And then from there, I was lost for a little bit. I started working in a factory. Uh, and then a friend, he put me on to uh, the possibility of going to Cuba. He talked about it. It was a Cuban friend of mine. And then from there, uh, decided to set my goal. One day I want to go to Cuba and see what it's like for myself. So uh, that had to wait a little bit. You know, I had to save up some money. Uh, during that time, I, I started training in boxing uh, out in Long Island. And then uh, after I had saved up some money, I went out to Cuba and saw it for, you know, with my eyes, and, um, you know, I fell in love with the sport, I fell in love with the, the training, the, the discipline, uh, the good diet, the, 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 you know, how to take care of yourself very well. And when I started learning about Islam, it, it related very similar things, where you have to take care of your body, uh, stay away from pork and alcohol, um, how to uh, treat others with, res with respect, um, and, it, and it drew a lot of similarities that I liked, and over time, uh, I eventually became Muslim. Uh, the story of how I became Muslim, I was in Astoria, and there was a mosque that um, I'd always walked by many times. So even though I was a Muslim, I was still practicing fasting. I guess it's like a sign of solidarity. And uh, I had to make a donation to have my fast be accepted. So I, since that was the only mosque that I knew in a story, I walked in with my checkbook and I asked a, a young kid in the lobby area, um, what's the name of this mosque so that I can write out uh, a donation? So uh, he said, give me a few minutes, let me find out. So he leaves, he comes back, and he says, come on in, we have uh, a few people that want to talk to you. So I'm like, sure. So then I go in, there's a group of guys sitting in a circle on the floor. One guy has a book. And one of them turns to me and says, do you want to be Muslim? I'm like, yeah. And then he says, you know, repeat this. And he says some things in Arabic. And then I uh, repeated them. And he says, OK, now you're Muslim. So I said, in my mind, I was thinking, I said, well, I didn't mean I wanted to be Muslim right there that second. I eventually wanted to become Muslim. But he got me. So. Uh, from then on, I was Muslim, and uh, they were really big into Tablighi Jama'at, where uh, 
it's very similar, uh, some similarities with um, Jehovah's Witnesses where they visit people's houses and they encourage them to come to the mosque. And uh, I was there for a while and then I moved uh, back to Long Island because at the time I was living in Nassau County and I, I moved back to Suffolk County. Um, and then from there, that's when I met a caretaker of the mosque uh, that I was going to in my local mosque and he was of Afghani descent. And he used to tell me stories of Afghanistan. He was uh, from Kandahar. So uh, he told me a lot of stories about the Taliban and its origins. And that's how I got intru introduced to um, Afghan culture, Afghan, um, I guess, traditions. And then little by little, I started learning about conspiracy theories of different um, secret organizations in the world. Uh, I started listening to Anwar al awlaki on, uh, on these uh, MP3 discs that I got as gifts from certain friends. Uh, back when YouTube was unregulated, you could see a lot of jihadi videos on YouTube. And um, that was, I guess, the beginning of me starting to shift into being pro-jihadism. So uh, eventually, uh, I, and, and the big turning point was uh, a friend of mine at the time, uh, he was in the military and we were debating back and forth in an email uh, of things that I didn't like about U.S. foreign policy. And he said, you know what, you, you're a lot like most people where they just talk and they never do anything about something that they feel is wrong in the world. And then afterwards I, I thought about it and I said, you know what, he's got a, he's got a good point there. And that was like the turning point, the, the major turning point of me wanting to go overseas. Uh, so I a friend of mine, he, he put me on to this book by uh, Omar Nasiri called Inside the Jihad. And it was about this young guy's uh, journey from uh, Western Europe, how he got into Pakistan and made his way into Afghanistan. And then he joined Al-Qaeda when Al-Qaeda was still the guest of the Taliban when they controlled Kabul. And I decided, you know what, this could be a, a template for me to sort of use to figure out how to get my way uh, into Afghanistan and join a Sunni group. Uh, and then set up my, I saved up some money, I went overseas, I went to Pakistan, I uh, had a friend set me up to have a guide into Peshawar, uh, and then from Peshawar I joined one group, uh, and they sent me into, well, that was the journey of me going into the tribal areas, and that's a different world on its own, so. Um, and then once you're in that network of different militants and uh, different fighting groups. Eventually, I found my way into Al Qaeda, and then eventually, in let's see, November of '08, I, I was captured and I got uh, extradited back to New York, and I cooperated uh, with the government. So, I think I pretty much covered what I was hoping to. I don't know if uh, there's anything else. Okay. you also have as well. So I'd just like to start with, if there's anything you feel like you can't address, please let me know and then we can move on to a different topic. But Brian, you took us back to the beginning of your journey into adulthood and just as an outsider trying to be as objective as possible, it seemed to me that a strict and structured lifestyle became important to you. And so you were raised in a Christian family, you went into the military, became a trained boxer, and then found Islam. So some may say that there's no connection between sports, military, and religion, but all those activities do require dedication and a formal structure. I'm wondering if you could share your thoughts. Sure. Um, when you're trying to figure out what to do with your life after high school, uh, either getting into sports or having religion as, as sort of a guide to go about your day-to-day -day life can be important for some people. I know it's very important to me and I, you know, it stuck with me. And, uh, unfortunately, I, I took it a little too far and I ended up uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, I, I agree with that. And so I'm wondering, after your time in Fort Jackson and then when you went to Cuba and then you came back to New York, mm -hmm. something changed. 
So what compelled you to be on the other side of the conflict with the then and now war on terror? I think um, it was a combination of, of several things. And um, I feel that Anwar al-Awlaki um, propaganda was very influential. Uh, like I mentioned before with my friend uh, at the time, uh, him telling me, you know, and stop complaining and do something about it. Mm -hmm. That was also another thing. And also, I didn't have uh, any kids. I wasn't married, so I didn't have anything to hold me back uh, in New York. And I said, you know what? I, I, I think going overseas is easier for me than people who do have kids or, or have a wife or have uh, a close family structure to, you know, to stay home. But, so a combination of several things caused me to go overseas. And at that point, there were a lot of demonstrations or, I guess, just reactions that weren't causing people to travel abroad, but mm -hmm. you felt like that was something that you wanted to do. Was there like a trigger that made you feel like, I need to travel, or was it just because of your personal circumstances that you just mentioned? Uh, personal circumstances, and, um, and, and like I said, it was an accumulation of, of several things okay. that, that made me decide to go overseas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so just now and also in the article that you and Mitch recently wrote, you highlight Omar in a series book, and I've also read that. You mentioned that it served as a template for travel, but what else about it spoke to you? Uh, it talked a lot about how if a guy was dedicated enough, uh, and I guess if he was charismatic enough, because he, he was a charismatic figure in the book, um, and, and he had some good instincts, street instincts, that he could mm -hmm. hopefully you know, find his way over to Afghanistan, and I thought, you know what, I think I can, I can do it as well. And based upon you know, your interactions abroad and also what he wrote, did you feel like it was an accurate portrayal of what to expect now in retrospect? Um, in retrospect, it was a little off. Okay. Um, obviously, when he went, it was before 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, after 9-11, it's a lot harder. And I'm pretty sure even while I was incarcerated, it's changed even more difficult uh, right now. Um, but it was, it was good enough just to give me an idea of, of what to expect mm -hmm. overseas. So. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. So once you reached, did you have any difficulty adjusting to life outside the U.S.? I know that you had some sort of illnesses, um, which many people can have to manage. But apart from that, did you feel that there was any difficulty adjusting? A little bit of a culture shock. I mean, um, growing up in New York is different than growing up uh, in, in Peshawar or Lahore right. or the tribal areas is a very different lifestyle. Um, yeah, language was obviously a problem. Not everybody speaks English, but it used to be a British colony, so English is studied well out there. So I, I could just do enough to get around. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just so, it's just the culture is so much different. So I guess, I guess it was like a culture shock in the beginning, but eventually you adjust. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you feel the same sense of belonging once you arrived there? Or did it bother you that people thought that you might be a spy? Well, I, I understood if people thought I was a spy. But over time, mm -hmm. uh, I was able to win a lot of hearts over. Mm -hmm. um, I even had one guy tell me, he's like, you know, in the beginning, I thought you were a spy. So he, he told me you know, straight up. But um, I think over time, once people saw that I wasn't doing anything suspicious, I wasn't mm -hmm. uh, trying to Know, create any problems, any, any chaos, uh, over time a lot of them just let that go. Okay. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us any more about your training, apart from what's in the article? Or you, can you, for people who haven't read it yet, tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Um, basic training camp is uh, about three weeks long, and you deal mostly with uh, Soviet weapons, uh, AK-47, RPG-7 rocket launcher, uh, PK machine gun. Um, they go a little bit into explosives theory, uh, uh, landmine theories. Um, and then on the last day, you go out for target practice. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, you, you can move on to other courses afterwards. But um, right. it's, just, it's just a quick, basic uh, history on the weapons and how to fire them. That, that's basically it. And at any point while you were in training, did you start to question your actions? You know, it's often highlighted that you did not want to conduct a mission in the West. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I was asked that a lot by um, certain people, even just people that just met me just for a few minutes. They're like, why don't you do something, in, you know, back in the West? And I said, well, I made all the effort to come over here. Why would I go back? 
uh, and do it there. And if I wanted to do something there, I could have just stayed there and done it myself. Okay. But I made all the effort to get to, you know, the the tribal area, and that's where I thought I was going to stay. Mm -hmm. And also in the article, you talked about feeling manipulated by people you were with, mm -hmm. and that you didn't have enough religious training to become a suicide bomber. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering. Why do you think they told that to you, and did it, what did it mean to you? And so did you feel that you had a higher purpose, which is why they were telling you you didn't have the training yet, or did you feel like you were being betrayed? Uh, later on, I figured out um, from somebody that was familiar with the group that they were using me to raise money. Okay. So they were telling people, look, we have an American here. We, we, if you could help us out with some money so we could take care of him. And they would pocket all the money and never give me anything. So. They were using me almost like a mascot. And, I, and that's what I feel is the real reason why they didn't want to send me out to any type of missions, whether it's combat or suicide bombing. I, I just, they were connected with the ISI, so mm -hmm. they had their own agenda. Okay, and did you talk to people about that or was it sometime later that you found out that they had a different purpose? It was after I left the group okay. I, I found out. So you also talk about how advanced training courses seemed accessible to those who had more money. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so if, uh, if you had some money, you could sign up for either a sniper course mm -hmm. or a pistols course. Um, and you had to pay for either the ammunition or uh, the weapons that you needed for that. And if you're from the rich Gulf countries, it's no problem. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, like me, I didn't have income coming in. I didn't have uh, family to send me uh, money. Um, you know, it was a lot harder for, for someone who didn't have money to take those courses. So I, I thought it was a little unfair, but uh, you know, nothing I could do about it. And did that bother you at all, knowing that just be, that you had to even pay to get advanced training when you had gone there to receive it in the first place? Yeah, a little bit, because I thought um, it should be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it was expensive, and that's the way you know, that's how they ran the courses. There's nothing I could do about it. Uh, I wish I, you know, everything was for free mm -hmm. and that it was for, f you know, fair for everybody, but that's not how it worked. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Mitch, I'm wondering, have you come across similar information about the cost of an access to training with other international violent extremist groups? Not so much in that you had to pay for particular courses for training. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, there have been other Americans, other New Yorkers, other Brits who brought funding with them, who brought material with them um, to Al-Qaeda just because Al-Qaeda, to some degree, was in the business of, you know, raising funds and trying to get material from wherever they could get, but not so much that it was correlated that you cannot participate in a particular course unless you, you know, essentially enroll in it like you might at a university or some type of vocational school. So that was a really interesting element to the discussion, you know, with Brian, um, and and we one that we thought was worth, you know, putting out there in the public domain. Okay. And is there anything else that you've learned after having these conversations, just to kind of, I guess, engage people to figure out what the next steps are for understanding why groups are structured this way, or have you received any other feedback, I guess, from once you put it in the public domain about? how things are structured when it comes to training. Well, I know a lot of uh, people have picked up on some of Brian's comments that it was boring mm -hmm. for the most part in the camps. And I think <clears throat> there is a very romanticized view when you're you know, in Paris, New York, London, LA, um, about what it's like overseas. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about countering violent extremism later, but if there's a way and this is one way to sort of get out the word that, well, that's not quite what it's like. You're going to be surprised when you get overseas. Um, you know, maybe that will dissuade some people mm -hmm. who might otherwise consider going to in Iraq, Syria, and Af Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen. So I think that's, you know, in hearing that from Brian, that seemed like something worthwhile to highlight that, you know, in a sense, only he can say because he's been there. He's been in the camps. Thank you. So Brian, you discussed in the article that you were wary to leave Afghanistan and Pakistan for missions. Um, was there anything beyond what you just mentioned a moment ago about why you, know, you traveled there in the first place, you just didn't want to leave? Is, does that summarize it, or was there anything else about not wanting to leave that territory? 
Um, yeah, there's always that, that element that you could get um, arrested at an airport if I mm -hmm. wanted to go home. Um, it was always the fear of, of people informing on you. Mm -hmm. So even if I wanted to go back home, which you know a lot of people do feel homesick and they think about going home, um, the risk of um, getting apprehended by authorities is very high. So um, you're kind of stuck there until something happens. You know. Okay. Mm -hmm. After not being caught for so long, did you feel like it was a matter of time, or were you surprised when you were confronted in Peshawar? I was a little surprised because um, I was in the marketplace looking at a rifle scope, and a cop came in and was yelling in Pashto at me and my friend. And my friend said, no, we got to go outside, step outside. So I'm thinking, OK, it's probably just a misunderstanding. He, he, he sees a foreigner. What is, he, what, am I, what is he doing here? So I said, no, hold on, hold on. So I showed him my passport. My visa was good. My, my passport was still valid. And I thought it would get cleared up in a few minutes, and I would you know, go about my way. But uh, he never let, let me and my friend go. And uh, eventually, I was handed over to US authorities, and I got extradited. Okay. So. so Mitch, why do you believe that Bryant was able to operate under the radar for so long? You know, I think if we go back to 2008, 2007, you know, as Bryant is, is changing and you know, coming to the, the viewpoint that he wants to do something, he wants to travel overseas, I think Bryant was unique in that he wasn't part of a group, per se. And to some degree, you know, our view that, oh, he's part of this Islamist thinkers society group you know, is wrong. And that's something that also came out of our discussions. Yes, he was friends with one individual. But at least from the standpoint of investigations, investigations are always easier from a law enforcement perspective when there's a, a group that you know, gives you some type of indication that they need to be looked at. So there's some uh, um, you know, uh, predicate for that. So Bryant really operated on his own. And you know, to some degree, it, it fairly, was fairly disciplined about it. He was looking at websites, um, but he was um, he managed to figure out how to travel overseas without setting off um, what normally might have been red flags, even where he chose to land in Pakistan. Um, and a lot of his radicalization was online. Um, you know, what we call, people call self-radicalization, but it wasn't in, again, a group, and there wasn't a lot of communications, which can also be something that might trip, uh, you know, set off tripwires for law enforcement or intelligence to know that there's a person turning toward violence. Thank you. So just in follow-up to that, Brian, did you feel like there was anything you were doing online that should have alerted authorities sooner? You know, I was very careful not to go into any uh, jihadi chat rooms, okay. um, trying to reach out to certain individuals on the phone talking about jihadism. I, anytime I wanted to talk about it, the, the few times that I wanted to, it was only with a, a handful of friends that I trusted. Um, I was afraid to talk about anything like that over the phone in case somebody was, you know, tapping my phone. So I was, I was very cautious, very careful who I spoke to and how I spoke about jihadism. So, so Mitch, in the article, you and Brian discussed that it was difficult for the Joint Terrorism Task Force to believe that there was no formal ceremony or contractual agreement to join the group. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, and Brian should respond to that as well. I think just in general, you know, not the point to figure out a particular organization, um, but in general, law enforcement and intelligence, we all thought um, that if you're joining this group, this elite group, um, this group that you're essentially willing to lay your life on the line for, there must be some obligatory oath or, or something to sort of formalize your joining of that group. So I think that was just sort of the operating principles that, you know, writ large, the, the intelligence communities in the West were, were, were operating, that you had to swear some type of bayat or oath. Um, so, you know, when, when Bryant, um, you know, explained that, you know, to, you know, the JTTF2, you know, to, to me, um, yeah, that was sort of surprising. Would you like to respond? Yeah, there's, um, for people uh, who are used to dealing maybe with uh, organized crime or with gangs, um, there's this, I guess, misunderstanding that all groups, you know, you either have to prove yourself or mm -hmm. you have to swear some type of oath, and I didn't have to do any of that. I think, um, you know, once you're there and, you know, the, as long as you're not causing any trouble, they kind of leave you alone and they believe that 
uh, you're there for the right reasons and you don't need to prove yourself. So. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. So switching a little bit to CT and CBE for both of you, there are many theories on the concept of radicalization and extremism. So what are your thoughts on them? How would you define either of the terms? And then, Bryant, based on your definitions, do you consider yourself to have been radicalized? Oh, yeah, I went through uh, a phase where I was radicalized, I, I admit it. i um, not very proud of it. But um, I think once I, I spent time in prison and, and I was you know, working with the FBI, I was working with uh, other law enforcement from around the world, um, you know, my judge, he gave me a second chance of life. And, you know, I'm taking full advantage of it as best I could, uh, best I can. Um, to de-radicalize is, is, you know, if, if you want to leave that old life behind, you have to cut ties with everything. Um, and as far as, what was the other part of your question? If you, what your definition of extremism and radicalization is, and then mm -hmm. based on your definitions, do you feel like you were radicalized? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can get carried away with listening to a message or, mm -hmm. Um, taking one thing and misinterpreting it, um, listening to the wrong people, give you a wrong angle of certain things. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's the best definition that I think uh, that I understand the way it is and how I experience it. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Mm -hmm. Mitch, would you like to respond? Sure. I mean, you know, we spent a lot of time at the NYPD looking at the phenomena of radicalization of, of Westerners, and, you know, I. I've used Bryant, in fact, in presentations because so much of his process seems to have fit you know, the parameters of what we looked at. He was an individual who you wouldn't have thought he was going to take that pathway. Um, he wasn't someone who, you know, had, there was any predetermined reason why he would radicalize. He had a bit of an identity crisis, as he described after high school. What is he going to get involved in? You know, he found an ideology that resonated with him, that appealed to him. Um, so he began to self-identify with that and, you know, ultimately sort of adopted that ideology as his own, um, you know, converted to Islam, took on a new persona, and then ultimately, you know, decided that there was a grievance that he needed to redress. Mm -hmm. He needed to take some type of action. Um, Dawa protests in, in, against the war wasn't going to be enough. He needed to travel to a field of jihad to do something and essentially turned to violence. And in his framework, the violence was going to be against an unjust invader of Muslim lands. And then, you know, and then the final piece was what happened in Afghanistan, where a discussion was begun about, well, what about where do we look to hit in the West? And you know, for specific reasons, at a certain point in time, Bryant was willing to consider that there are legitimate targets in the US, in New York City, and spoke to Al Qaeda about. So in your respective opinions, why is there such a large gang focus, and you touched a little bit on that, with regard to countering violent extremism programming development in the US? Um, I just think there's not enough information on every group. I think every group is, is different. Um, and I think as, you know, I guess cooperators help uh, law enforcement uh, get a better understanding of every group, I think, over time. Uh, techniques on learning how different organizations are, it'll, it'll help law enforcement co combat that. So I think it, it, a lot of it involves um, cooperators helping out law enforcement. So do you yeah. feel like the way that it's approached with kind of a, a, a gang structure or kind of how law enforcement or individuals go to, to manage that is in line with other types of extremist groups or terrorist organizations, do you feel like that's the correct approach or should it be No, I think, I think, I think every group should be analyzed differently. Okay, so every individual group needs to have its own approach. Yes, because okay. um, even though some groups may have similarities, there's also differences in every group. Okay. And I think the best way is to approach each group uh, differently. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And then, Bryant, since you've completed your prison sentence, I'm wondering, have you connected with any of your old friends or family on Long Island? No. So now I'm hoping that we could do a little bit of future casting. So what do you both believe it would take to end the conflict with Al Qaeda in the West? Well, that's tough. Um, 
there really is no right answer because if you make one group happy, another group wouldn't be happy. Uh, if there's withdrawal of military forces, it, it would, Afghanistan would probably turn into civil war again. Um, there really is no right answer to make everybody happy. So I, I, I don't have a, a good answer for that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Would you like to come? I think the U.S. is, is doing uh, much of, of what can be done to degrade the threat as it's concerned al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. You know, there's a military element um, trying to remove safe havens. Um, there's a counterterrorism element um, to prevent individuals from traveling overseas, intelligence collection, intelligence sharing, um, study of these groups. And the, the piece that potentially is missing is that these groups um, you know, as we talk about different franchises beyond al-Qaeda core and the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, there are also regional conflicts in which they're arising in um, because there's a vacuum. There's not a strong central government, um, and people are looking for some alternative answer. And this form of Islamic governance or protest against a central government, you know, ends up being something that appeals um, to people in, in Yemen, in a Somalia. So there are multiple layers, but at least in many of the pieces, the U.S. is doing much of what it can do. Thank you. So, Brian, do you feel like you've been able to reintegrate into American society? I'm trying the best I can. It's not easy, but uh, little by little, um, I started going to school for uh, asbestos and lead paint removal. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working with Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Mm -hmm. Um, doing some projects with Mitch um, to give me opportunities to come places like here. Um, so I've been laying low key uh, since uh, I came out, and just recently I started, you know, working and trying to, you know, um, just help people get a better understanding of jihadism. So uh, I promised my judge I'd turn a bad thing into a good thing, and hopefully, you know, I keep on doing that, and it'll help me reintegrate and be. Um, a productive citizen society can. Mm -hmm. And are your views on the war on terror different from about 10 to 15 years ago? Oh yes. Um, when you when I went overseas, um, you know, you think that it's it's a very beautiful path to to go to the battlefield, and it's not. Uh, there are a lot of different groups out there, not just Al Qaeda, not just Taliban. A lot of smaller groups. Uh, there's a lot of people doing. Um, behind the scenes dirty work. For example, like the ISI has their hand in the war. Mm -hmm. um, you have different warlords that want to protect their own land. They have, you have people protecting the opium fields. So it's, it's a mixture of hidden agendas mixed in with the war. And that's not taught to you uh, during the jihadi videos that you see. So mm -hmm. it, my perspective is much different from my experience mm -hmm. over there. And do you feel that your story is told with accuracy? And is there something you want people to know about you that's often not discussed? Um, yeah, in the beginning, there's a lot of inaccuracies. And slowly, I'm trying to correct some of the inaccuracies. Um, it's just that I guess people that I, uh, for, from my perspective, what I'd like them to know is that um, you know, I made a mistake. I'm very sorry. Um, trying to work with people like Mitch, uh, continue working with other groups to help educate them on jihadism, and I'm just going to do that for, for a while. So. And what is your hope for the future? Um, to live a peaceful life and to just keep on helping people. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if we have any questions from the audience, and we'll have a microphone coming in the back, so just give us one moment, please. <coughs> So we'll start just in the back here. Here, Wesley. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you touched on the ISI a, a couple of times, and in your article, you you talk about how extensive uh, an influence they have on the war in uh, Afghanistan. Could you talk specifically to uh, what level of interaction uh, they had uh, with Al Qaeda itself, uh, based on, on on what you observed and what you heard? Yes, uh, I remember, the only connection that I remember hearing at one time was uh, the leader of the first group that I was with, his name was Shah Saab. And 
from what I heard, he was in a meeting with some Al-Qaeda leaders. I don't know which one, but uh, then afterwards I'm thinking, why are they having um, like a meeting together when Shah Saab was with the ISI? So that's the only thing that, that stunned me that, to learn, and I don't know what they were talking about, but it was something that I, 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 I didn't like. So. And then also we'll move forward. So in the purple shirt, please. Uh, thank you, and thank you for coming to speak with us all. If you wouldn't mind going back to the U.S. military for a minute, I'm struck by something that jumped out at our moderator as well, that you mentioned at several points structure, discipline, uh, in all of these places that you were looking to go. The military would seem an obvious place to find all of that, so I'm, I'm curious about the dissonance. Why wasn't it for you, and if there's something in there that you could speak to in a little more detail? Sure. Um... The biggest problem I had that, that really upset me being in the military was being punished for somebody else's mistake, and that just didn't fly with me. You could do everything fine, and somebody in your group could do something wrong, and then everybody's getting punished, and I said, you know what? I'm doing everything right that I'm supposed to do, so why am I um, being punished for him? And after a while, you know, it started getting to me, and I, that wasn't for me. Hi. Um, I have two questions. One, you had mentioned that your reintegration back into civilian life hasn't been particularly easy, and I'm wondering what would make it easier or what would have made it easier. And then the second is, was there a potential for a turning point prior to departing from the United States? Could someone have said something someone intervened in some kind of way, and would that have prevented you from going overseas? Thanks. Okay. Uh, first part of your question, um, let's see. Repeat that one more time, just want to make sure I answer it correctly. Yeah, I think if somebody would have intervened or talked to me, yeah, I, I, I think if somebody would have came uh, somebody with experience overseas and would have told me, you know, it's not the way it is, uh, it's, per it's portrayed, it's not the way that it's told uh, in the different MP3 uh, audios that you have or the jihadi videos that you've seen. Uh, I, I think that could have made a big influence on me deciding whether to go overseas or not. Um, now, what could make it easier to get back into society? Um, I think in prison, they don't have a lot of vocational training where I was at. Um, maybe like a support system so that when somebody with jihadi charges comes out, they have somebody to lean on. Uh, I, did, I didn't have any of that, and I kind of had to figure it out on my own. So. Mm -hmm. And can we go to the side, please, Leslie? Thanks. So building off of the question of the military experience, your experience with the groups, did you feel camaraderie with those groups? Did it feel like a team when you were um, on the ground in Afghanistan, Pakistan? Yes. Um, it, it didn't have a military feel, like a traditional U.S. military feel of um, strictness or Everybody had to do things an exact certain way, otherwise there's consequences if you don't do it. It was more of a, you know, like a, a bunch of good friends together hanging out. Um, so the, even though it was military training, it, w it wasn't as strict as it was in, in my time in the U.S. Army. Um, there is some camaraderie because a lot of people, they, we all get dysentery, we all miss our food back home. Uh, a lot of them miss their wives and, and, and kids and, and family members. So, uh, you know, there is that, that unity of, of everybody being homesick, everybody wanting to go back home just to say hello to somebody just for a few minutes. So all of us share that, that same problems, and it helped, you know, bring us all together a little bit better. So I agree, yes. You, you talked about 
seeing videos online. Can you talk about some of the visual materials you looked like? Did you read like Al Qaeda's Inspire magazine online? These things are really easy to find. Some of the photographs. And when you went over, did you actually see anyone creating these things, or what kind of materials were people looking at or listening to? Music, videos that inspired you and kept that romanticization, romanticization alive. Yeah, a few brothers had. Um some laptops with them, so they may have had some jihadi videos on their laptop, and to kill time, maybe we'd all gather around their computer and, and see these videos. Uh, there's always audio uh, available on MP3s that people have. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, obviously, talking about it uh, amongst the brothers that were educated enough. Um, and sometimes you actually saw people that were in jihadi videos and you spent time with them. For example, I was around Abu Yahya al Libi, so I, I spent time with him, even though I didn't talk with him because he didn't speak English and I didn't speak Arabic. But just the presence of around him uh, was something special. Um, as far as what I saw, in the beginning when YouTube was getting around, they, they didn't really take off jihadi videos that fast. So sometimes you could watch jihadi videos for weeks before it would get taken off. So most of the stuff that I saw online was on YouTube. I hope I answered your question. Okay, good. Any other questions? I'm struck that, um, you know, a New Yorker is here having this conversation with us. So I'm curious if you can share with us what your experience of the World Trade Center attacks was and w whether or not we have a shared experience together in that and, and if you've had a chance to reflect over time on how that event may have actually led to your eventual travels over to Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't in New York uh, during 9-11. I was in South America. I was in Peru uh, visiting family on my father's side of the family. Uh, and I was watching it on TV, and it looked like a movie. It, it didn't look uh, like it was really happening. It felt uh, surreal. Um, and then afterwards, uh, like a friend of mine, he was talking to me about different conspiracy theories about this group was behind it, or uh, it was, it was pre-planned, and, and I, I fell into that. Uh, looking back on it now, it's, it's a sad thing. And I remember I was watching it on TV, and I was very sad. Um, and it's, you know, my, my views haven't changed. It's, it's still a sad day. I remember, like if it was yesterday, the, the moment that I saw it on TV. So uh, nothing's changed as far as that. Uh, I have two questions. And um, I will say the first one, feel free to decline to answer, mm -hmm. um, because I know that it can be difficult to talk about. Um, like the details of time while incarcerated. Um, but I'm curious to know how the specific charges that were brought against you impacted your interactions with other incarcerated people. Um, and then second, um, I think that this is a really interesting way for a collaboration to be happening between uh, law enforcement and somebody who um, has formerly been involved with Al Qaeda. Um, I'm curious to know how you think this can act as a model for future efforts towards reconciliation and uh, future efforts for kind of reintegrating um, people who have gone down a similar path back into the U.S. Okay, um, my time in prison, uh, some people had a problem with my charges because they were like, oh, look at that terrorist. And some people didn't talk to me, and some people did, and some people didn't care. You know, I, I carried about... I carried myself in a way where uh, I wasn't instigating or, or I wasn't uh, trying to cause problems. And usually in prison, if you're quiet and you're to yourself, that's usually the best way to avoid trouble. Um, and what was your second part of your question, ma'am? Um, how your relationship with law enforcement and how you interacted with law enforcement and the people who were trying to be Yeah, I mean, uh, as part of my plea agreement, I had to tell everything. Uh, and I think that if cooperators uh, follow that rule and, and they give everything that they have, um, that it could you know, help with your prison time being short and as, as little as possible. And you, obviously, you build a, a good connection with law enforcement if you're honest and you give everything you have. Uh, I, I was treated well. Um, 
you know, once I started telling everything that I knew. And uh, I think that helped my, with my relationship with uh, my FBI agents uh, when I was cooperating. Uh, I, think, I think being honest and telling everything that you know uh, helps out a lot. Mm -hmm. And did your relationship once with law enforcement, once you started speaking with them, did that help you to change your perspectives on what was going on? Yes, that, that uh, affected me a lot. Uh, my FBI agent, Eddie, was very good to me. Erica has been very good to me. She's actually in the audience, so I miss your chocolate chip cookies you just sent me. <laughs> so so, so I, was, I've, I had a good relationship with my FBI agent, yeah. So that overall you felt that that was a way to help you, I guess, change your viewpoints. So we had talked a little bit about, I guess, some misinformation that you felt that you were receiving, which contributed to you becoming radicalized. And so having different interactions, you felt kind of brought you back. Yes, yes, I agree. I, I think being treated well does, uh, it helps you soften your heart and, okay. you know, give better information, mm -hmm. um, gives you better energy when you have to go in and, mm -hmm. and cooperate. Because, you know, uh, when, you, when you're uh, giving information to FBI for so many hours, it can be mentally draining. Right. But um, being treated well, or being treated with respect does help out a lot. So that, that was my interactions with the FBI. And I think going off of that question that we just received, Mitch, could you tell us a little bit more about parallel networks and what this type of work is aiming to do? Sure. You know, in, in the U.S., Brian is, is obviously, uh, you know, a very rare commodity. An individual who joined a terrorist organization, cooperated, served his prison time, and is now, uh, you know, now back in society. And in the U.S., we have approximately about 400-plus people incarcerated post-9-11 terrorism-related offenses. Now, over the next five years, about 100 of those people will also be coming back into society. And, you know, Bryant has navigated a very difficult situation, you know, very well. Um, there are a few others who, who have also. But, you know, the concern is, what is the rate of recidivism, uh, whether it's back to some type of terrorism-related issue or some other t type of criminality, and how can, in the U.S., we reduce the likelihood of that? So the idea of parallel networks is to work in the CVE space, um, both pre-radicalization, but also working with individuals who are likely to be released from prison and help them make that transition that Brian described as, as tricky and difficult and help smooth that out, with be that support system you know, for them uh, as they find their way uh, into their new life back in society. Before I go back to the audience, I have one other follow-up. Just in terms of CVE and the space with counter-narratives and narratives and alternative narratives, I'm wondering, do you feel, I guess both of you, do, it's, it's controversial and sometimes it's difficult to find metrics that can say whether or not they're successful or these types of programs are successful. What are your thoughts just on counter-narratives that either are government-run or civil society-run? Do you think that they can be effective if implemented correctly? Just overall your thoughts, I'd love to hear. Yeah, I, I think it could work, uh, influence a lot of people. I, I don't think it could uh, sway everybody, but I think it could um, help out a good chunk of people, uh, you know, to steer away from that viewpoint of extremism. Uh, I think, yeah, it could be either government funded or nonprofit organization funded. And I think just because it's such a new category to I mean, it's not even 20 years old. Uh, so it, it's still in the learning process of collecting data on what works and what doesn't work. But I think uh, it, can be, it can be successful. I agree. Yeah. And message versus messenger. So even if it's funded from a specific group, maybe finding the, the best messenger to give that message? Absolutely. Because it depends. Because some people may not be interested in hearing a counter narrative from a specific kind of group, but maybe somebody who they can relate to. So I think that's, that's another factor. And what about you, Mitch? Yeah, no, I agree. I think you've hit on the, the key element. The key element is who is the messenger, and does that messenger have some type of legitimacy? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a law enforcement person is speaking to an 18-year-old who's on ISIS websites and is listening to al and trying to convince them, you know, push against that narrative, um, that's going to be a different, a difficult argument. However, if you have someone like Bryant who can say, hey, listen, I went to the camps. I traveled overseas. I'm the real deal. Mm -hmm. 
And let me tell you, you don't want to go down that road. And that goes a little bit back to your sort of gang example. Someone who has the real life experience and legitimacy as Bryant can be that unique messenger and hopefully dissuade someone who otherwise would go down that road. So I think that's the key thing is identify unique messengers who've got the legitimacy. Okay, thank you. I know we have some more audience questions. So we'll start in the back. Thanks. Hi. My question is about the day you decide to go overseas to fight. So the content of the idea or the, the thoughts that you heard from Awlaki, for example, from Al Awlaki. So was it about the after death? Was it about the inequalities? Or what were, I mean, could you just classify them? Because many people think about the after uh, life, uh, after death life, about women, and stuff that, and the awards that God gives you. So could you just give me the, the most, the ideas that are really, that impacted you the most? Yes, um, having martyrdom on the battlefield is very honorable, and that's the, the path that I wanted to, to eventually have. Um, and the rewards in the afterlife, your, your sins are forgiven, uh, you can ask for forgiveness on certain family members or certain friends. If, uh, so, yeah, there's the, the hur, but, but uh, that really wasn't one of the top ones. I, I think just forgiveness for um, all the sins in my life, uh, I think that was probably the top one that I wanted to, to have if, if I had martyrdom. Um. Yes, on this side, please. We just have a microphone, just one second. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to know how hard or easy was it for you to travel to Afghanistan? You were, went to Pakistan and then you went to Afghanistan. And what kind of connection did you see between the two? And also, um, uh, if you saw any kind of support to Al-Qaeda from Pakistan. Um, and I also have a question for Mitch, if you can uh, give us, give me sort of the bigger picture, like how this works when some, um, when an American is uh, handed over to United States, how does that work between the countries? There has to be a treaty or yeah, uh, what's the process? Thanks. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah. Okay. You know, generally that, that's, happen, that's happening at the federal level. You know, the FBI, given their remit, is going to be the primary agency there, interacting, you know, with the other country through the LEGAT. Um, and then there's a process of bringing that individual, you know, back to the U.S. And, you know, that's going to be negotiated. You know, every case is different. Um, so it's tough to give an overall, you know, rule as to how that's going to happen. But generally, you know, it's going to be federal agencies in the lead. State Department's going to have a role there. FBI, intelligence agencies, probably more behind the scene. Um, but ultimately, the goal is to get that U.S. citizen back to the U.S. Um, you know, relatively quickly. Okay, so I think the first part of your question was um, how easy it was for me, I think. And what's the connection between the two besides this? Okay. Um, I was fortunate enough to know people to at least get me uh, from a starting point perspective to start somewhere you know if I didn't know anybody I think it would have been impossible for me so I had one friend uh, he asked around on my behalf uh, he knew an Afghan family uh, in the neighborhood who knew who had a cousin uh, in Pesh and that knew people in Peshawar so as you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody and that's how I found my way into Afghanistan. Some people, from what I heard, are there for years, and they never find a way into Afghanistan. And I was able to get there in a few weeks. So for everybody, it's different. I happen to know somebody. You know, the stars lined up uh, for me when, when I went there to figure out how to get to Afghanistan. No, my, actually it was never my intention to join Al-Qaeda. I just wanted to join a Sunni insurgent group. Uh, from the Omar Nasiri book, I, I thought I was going to end up with a Taliban group because there's so many of them. But I didn't know I was in Al-Qaeda until I was actually in there already. 
to a, a Kuwaiti friend, uh, I asked him one day, because there are many Arab groups out there, and I said, what group is this? And he said, this is Al-Qaeda. So I said, I said, this is not the way you see it in the videos, but I was in there, and that's how I found out I was in Al-Qaeda. I didn't plan to get into Al-Qaeda. That's just how it ended up happening. Thank you, uh, and thanks for coming and talking to us. I just had a question about kind of off ramps from jihadism. If while you were over there, you could have left, or if there could have been anything that the state could have done to get you or any of the other brothers that were with you to to give up arms and to step down. Yeah, I, I never heard of any type of um, like a surrendering program where if you realize it's not for you, you can just show up and and say I want out. Uh, that would be actually very helpful if there was some option where you could say, I've had enough, you know, what do you, what do you have to offer so that I could leave? That's actually a very interesting um, idea that I, I think should be explored more. Uh, if there was that option, I think a lot more people would, you know, opt out that way. Thanks, um, David Sturman, Senior Policy Analyst here at New America. You've talked about the role of um, Anwar al-Awlaki in your radicalization. Um, al-Awlaki, of course, himself was on his own sort of transformative path from someone who showed up at the Pentagon to talk about moderate Islam to open al-Qaeda figure. Um, and whether, you, whether that's radicalization or just him becoming more open, I'm wondering when you first watched um, al videos, listened to his lectures, um, how did you read him? Was this uh, someone who was just a cleric? Was he a jihadi cleric? Did you see him as part of al-Qaeda or an al-Qaeda representative? And did that shift over time? And if it did, did that affect um, your process of radicalization? A lot of his audio recordings um, when you listen to them, you don't know whether he's giving a jihadi viewpoint or not. So it's kind of like on the borderline. So if you are pro-jihadi and you listen to him, you're thinking, oh, okay, so he's leaning jihadi. That was also one of the, I guess, special qualities of his audio recording. And then later on, once he spent time in uh, a Yemeni prison, then he just was full leaning towards jihadism. But before that, uh, it was borderline. And if, if you were pro-jihadi, that's the, the perspective that you, that you listen to. So I think in the beginning, that's, that's how I interpreted it. Thank you very much for doing this. A couple of questions. First, I'm curious, how active are you right now in talking to people who might be at risk of following a path of joining a terror group or trying to become a jihadist? Do, do you think, and do you think that when you were at that point where you were going down that path, would a stronger, more empowered community, whether it was the, the, the Muslim community that you were with or just other friends and family, could have made more of a difference? Or would for you, and do you think for others, would it really have taken somebody who had been on the battlefield to say, your ideas are, are not going? And, and last question, when you look at what ISIS has done with their propaganda and the way they've been able to, to recruit and draw attention, even as they've been losing their caliphate, what do you think, how do you think you would have reacted back then to that type of propaganda? Would that have been something that would have hooked you and made you decide to go for ISIS rather than just any Sunni jihadist group? I, I think uh, right now I'm in the beginning stages of, of trying to reach out to certain people. Uh, I did have opportunities uh, to reach out to youths uh, before, but I turned it down, and it's something that I'm considering doing uh, right now. Um, I spoke with a guy in England who, who specializes in reaching out to youths that are leaning towards jihadism. Um, as far as ISIS propaganda, I, I was in prison when ISIS started forming, and um, I haven't learned enough about ISIS, and I haven't watched any ISIS videos since I've gotten out. I don't think my probation officer would be very happy if I was watching 
uh, ISIS videos. So I don't know enough. The little bit that I do know on uh, watching the news is that they're a little bit more reckless, and they take in just about anybody. Um, I, I think having somebody you know, reach out and saying, you know what, I was there. Uh, it's not the way it is in the videos. Uh, I think that could have made a, a big influence on me. Uh, obviously, I, I don't know, but I, that's what I think right now as I'm standing in front of you. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, that could be a very good technique to help dissuade uh, potential jihadis in the future. Um, you had mentioned that while, I can't remember if it was in Pakistan or Afghanistan, that um, you were approached with the idea of attacking the Long Island Railroad, I believe. How did you navigate that when you were approached with that question? Well, I was, um, I was in Waziristan, and uh, there was a, a mid-level uh, Al-Qaeda member. Uh, and I, I, his name was Yunus. So, a friend of mine, he was a close friend of mine in, in Al Qaeda. He says, Why don't you tell this idea to, to Yunus about the, the train system? So then I was speaking with Yunus, and we, you know, he was asking me a lot of questions on how it runs, the importance of it, the economic uh, impact that it could have. And he was just picking my brain, and he was um, shooting different ideas with me. Um, so that's, that's how I went about the discussion about the Long Island Railroad, was to attack the tunnel. Because all the lines on Long Island Railroad connect into one tunnel that go into Manhattan. So his, his belief was to do an economic target, not really a death toll target. Because uh, it would have hurt the New York economy uh, very bad. So. So we know that uh, you said you weren't ready, and the imam made you say the kalma, and then you were. He said that you were a Muslim. So my question is: Were you a practicing Muslim, and if you still are one, or did you never practice the Muslim Islamic faith? Yeah, in the beginning, I, I wasn't praying five times a day, and um, he was very um, big onto eating halal all the time. Um, after. You know, going overseas, I, I mean, I, as far as religion, I pray five times a day. And I stay away from pork and alcohol. But as far as it being halal chicken or halal beef, I don't, I don't do that. Are you I, a yes, I pray five times a day. And, I mean, I'm not a strict uh, following Muslim, but I watch TV, I listen to music, and stuff that you're not supposed to do, but I do it anyway. So. Uh, as a, as a person from Syria, I've witnessed Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and the first thing that they do, when, especially when foreign fighters come, they ask them to reach out like people they know and encourage them to call them or invite them to join the Al-Qaeda or ISIS or whatever. Have they approached you to communicate with some people, call them like to do attacks or like call them to come and join Al-Qaeda? No, that's not how it was uh, when I was in Afghanistan with the, the Khorasan, you know, the... I, I wasn't, that's not how the way it worked over there. Maybe in, in different regions around the world they work a little bit different, but that's not how it was when, when I was overseas. So. Um, I commend you for what you're doing now with your life. I think most of us here um, have some level of pride in you. Um, and so personally, I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. Um, so being, be, still being a Muslim, um, what does jihad mean to you now? I think the jihad that's um, going on right now is, is even though it's, it's portrayed as, as a holy war, there's so much hands behind the scene trying to grab their own personal gain from it that it's become twisted. And I don't think um, the pure religious jihad that you're taught in the, in the religious books uh, almost doesn't exist anymore. So um, as, as much as it's advertised that way, it's, it's not. So that's how I feel about it right now. 
and I think there, there's things where I wish could be better as far as relation-wise with the Muslim world and you know Western you know policymakers, but hopefully I can help uh, improve that a little bit. You know. Hi, thanks. Um, what about the Taliban? There's a lot of chatter these days about whether we should be negotiating with them for settlement in Afghanistan. Do you feel like they can be trusted, or are they evolving a lot since you were familiar with them? Or what was your actual direct exposure with Taliban when you were over there? Mm. Yes, I lived in a village which uh, was a pro-Taliban village. Um, it was in North Waziristan. Um, the man, uh, the house belonged to a man that, was, that actually knew Jalaluddin Haqqani personally. Um, I think it's important to have some involvement with the Taliban in negotiating because they're everywhere. So how could you avoid uh, the Taliban if you have to deal with them every day? Uh, I'm not an expert in policy, but I, I do think that some involvement has to be done. They, they can't be ignored. Okay, our final question is here. Thank you. So yeah, well, you were and, and the gentleman you were talking about, the guy in North Waziristan, that's Pakistan. That's not Afghanistan. You're talking about, right? Yes, even though uh -huh. it's within Pakistani border, it, with, within their border, it's kind of a no man's land. It doesn't really belong to Pakistan or Afghanistan because there's no police presence there. When the Pakistani military go through, they're armed in an armored convoy. Uh, it's very tribal. So technically it is within the Pakistani border, but it's, it's a no man's land. So now uh, my question was that, uh, did you see connection between uh, what you saw between Taliban and um, the Pakistan um, official, um, either the forces, ISI, or any kind of that kind of official mm. cooperation? I, I personally haven't seen it, but I've heard that there is some involvement with uh, Pakistani ISI and certain Taliban leaders. I, I have heard that. But I, I personally have no. So you heard it on the ground? From, from different people, from, from different Pashtuns, I've heard. So that brings us to the close of our session, but I want to thank you both, Brian and Mitch, for coming. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, and I just thank you for taking the time to come to New America. So thank you. Thank you.